Is this one? There you go. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one created all. I stand my soul to you surrendered. All I am is you. That's where we're headed today with today's sermon, because we're going to talk about the rich young ruler and what that means to us in 2016, about to be 17. So we stand, arms high, heart abandoned, in awe of the one who gave it all, Jesus. We're going to celebrate the table this morning. Stand my soul to you, Lord, surrender. All that I am, Lord Jesus. We thank you for today, Lord. We thank you. The Lord, as we sing these songs, Father, we're confessing to you about who we are, who we want to be, and Lord, how we want to be used and loved and led by you. And so, Father, as we come to your table today, Lord, as we use this, Lord, as our commitment Sunday, Father, we give ourselves to you. The Lord, you guide us as we look together at your word, Lord, as you guide us as we hear and, and, and interact with your word today. And Father, that last line of that song, that of course would be so well, that all we are is surrendered to you. It begins with our heart. And then Lord, you take care of our mind. You take care of the rest of our, our body. That Lord, we may be totally surrendered to you. These things, Jesus, we pray in your holy, your mighty, your blessed name. Amen. Amen. Our scripture this morning, is actually found in three places in Scripture. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And what we have here, we're going to, as we look at it, is going to be a composite of those three passages put together. It's known as the passage of the rich young ruler, but I've changed it to a bewildering, the bewildered young man because of what he does at the end of the passage. And so Jesus is teaching. The Pharisees are always asking Jesus questions. Amen? Amen. Amen. We like to ask questions, yes? Yes. yes. In the back there, yes? yes? Yes. Okay, good. Just want to make sure, because that's how you get answers. But the Pharisees keep trying to trip Jesus up, because they think, hey, whoa, how, you know, how do you do what you do? And Jesus just simply keeps talking. He keeps answering their questions. So Jesus is in the process of answering questions, and he starts talking about divorce, and all of that, and what Moses allowed, and, you know, let me, uh, uh, you know, uh, you shall leave and cleave, all of those kind of things we talk about when we get married. And then they, people bring him some children. He starts blessing the children, and the parents are happy. And, everyone, and then suddenly, in the middle of all of this, you ever notice when Jesus is out, there's always a crowd around? Jesus is never by himself, unless he goes up into the mountains to pray. But now he's here, he is down there talking with the people, and then this guy runs up, as uh, Luke and John say, and then he bows before Jesus. And here's the conversation that Matthew records. Now, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, No, oh, simple. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, and honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. The young man says, all these I've kept, what do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. Amen? Amen. Of course he said, well, come on. Amen. 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 All right. Because we read this story, and we go, oh, poor guy, oh, listen to it, look at it. Well, here's an illustration for you. This gentleman in uh, Eugene, Oregon, is reading this and he's praying it through because he wants to be holy like us. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so he says, I've been reading the story of Rich Young Ruler. And I realized that, you know, yes, he lives in an agricultural society, 
But you know, he's rich. But here I am. You know, I get to drive a car. I get to live in something other than the mud hut. You know, I get to go to whatever doctor I want. I take specialized medicines. I have penicillin. You know, I've had a hip replacement and a knee replacement. You know, I get to turn on the lights whenever I want to. I got a good paying job. I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got. Now, if that guy was rich, what am I? Because sometimes we need to reverse the thinking and realize that rich is not just money. Rich is what do I have? How has God blessed us? Amen? Amen. Amen. Imagine coming to church and we're in the Middle Ages. Okay? <laughs> Stay with me here. Because I've been to some of those churches that they built in the Middle Ages. Everything is candlelight. Then they came up with an organ. Okay? And so to play the organ, because we go to church, Sarah and I were talking about this morning. You go to a church and they play the pipe organ. It's so beautiful. You hear the pipes and everything. You know how they ran those pipe organs way back when? They got a little guy like Terrence or Matthew or Jake back there, and they put him up in the attic. And they had to run in place like a hamster to keep the thing going. So the was, okay, see how blessed you are, amen? We want music, we get the electronic piano. Now let's get to our guy. Because here's a couple things we need to deal with as we deal with this message this morning. Because this message is really about who we are before the Father. And so here we go. The first thing is this. He runs up to Jesus and we know a couple things about this guy, just from the descriptions. Here they are. That, first of all, he's respectful. He's young. He's rich. He bounds down before Jesus. And so we know that he's got a religious thing going on. He respects religious authority. He's earnest. What must I do to, be, to get eternal life? He's successful. He's ambitious. Sincere. Okay? Sound like anybody you know? Yeah. Religious, ambitious, you know? sincere, it's all of us. But the issue is he comes to Jesus with a simple question because we are raised this way with this question, what do I need to do? And what he's listening for is not A, B, C, and D, he's listening for what do I need to do better? Amen? Amen. Amen. Say it one more time. What do I need to do better? Amen? Amen. 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 Jesus says, you're missing a whole lot. So here it is. Here's the first answer. He says this. Why do you call me good? Because in the other two passages, he comes up to Jesus, and he says, good teacher, because he's trying to flatter Jesus. Matthew, because Matthew respects the lordship of Jesus so much, he switches the words around. What the thing must I do? What the other two uh, writers say, he tries to flatter Jesus, because, hey, Jesus, I like you. I like your style. What do I need to do to be like you? And Jesus says, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Why do you call me good? There's no one good but God alone. But then Jesus focuses it to the place where it needs to be, on God. God. What's your relationship like with the Father? Then he says, and keep the commandments. So Jesus starts leading him to the heart question. Obey these commandments that you may have life. Well, this is the young man, because what happens is, when we get confronted with things we really don't want to hear, the first thing we, place we go to is self-justification. Go ahead and say amen. Amen. Because it's true, yes? Yes. yes. I don't want to hear that answer, but here's what I got. <laughs> no. <laughs> Instead, Jesus, he says, the man says to Jesus, and I can see him saying this indignantly, well, wait a minute, I came to ask you a simple question. What must I do? And Jesus says, obey the commandment. Oh, look, I've been keeping those things. Help me come up. Which ones? Jesus simply says to him a couple of given. It would be nice if Jesus laid out this home loan that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. You should do X, Y, Z, and W. And you should jump through every group all the time. No. Jesus gives him six things. Simple things. Easy things. We read them, but here they are. The first one is this one. Do not murder. Okay. Do not commit adultery. Okay. Do not steal. Don't be covetous. You know, we live in a world where it's easy to steal stuff with the intellectual properties and all that. Nobody would mind if I make six copies of the I'm guilty of that. 
Oh, yeah, I got that here. Let me give you a copy so you can see. But don't you listen to the Lord away. I got busted on that one. Do not do that. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> then, let's get through. do not lie. Don't give false testimony. Don't lie. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Be truthful in your interactions. Then he lays this one out. And he puts this, because this one comes first, but he puts it last. Honor your father and mother. And then Jesus says this to him. By the way, those five are good, but here's what I really want you to do. I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, cogitate this. Think this through. Wait a minute, Jesus, you're laying this on me. All I want to know, what do I need to do? Tell me, do you need me to build a new church? you need me to go buy a new house? Tell me what to do. Jesus gets into his head. Because Jesus is trying to get into his head so that he can get to his heart, get into his heart so he can get to his head. Now, what do all these commandments have to do with one another? It's very simple. They each have to do with our relationships. He's religious. He knows these things. But what Jesus is doing, Jesus is perceiving his thought process and perceiving where his heart is. What are you doing in your relationships? Are you stealing? Are you lying? Are you committing adultery? How do you treat your parents? Do you honor them? What are you doing? Because Jesus is trying to say, I want you if you really want to live, if you really want to have abundant life, if you really want to have eternal life, go to the next one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Because if I'm doing, if I'm loving my neighbor as myself, then I don't have to worry about those top five. Why? Because my relationships are intact. Because Jesus is saying, do you really got a heart problem? It's not what you do. I want you to be. Got that? I want you to be. Now what you do. So here's his justification. Because remember now, a little indignation, come on, man, which ones? You know, I'll do better. So I don't want you to do better. I want you to be. I want you to relax. This is justification. All these I've kept since I was a kid. So apparently he grew up in the temple. And Jesus says, he says, well, what do I still lack? Well, again, I want to do better. Tell me what to do better. Jesus gives it to him. But Jesus keeps driving to his heart as Jesus tries to drive to our heart. Because Jesus wants, once our heart issue is settled, everything else is settled. And so Jesus says this as he speaks to his heart. First of all, if you want to be perfect. Yeah, we all want to be perfect. Yes? Yes. yes. But what he's looking at there is not the perfect. And, you know, we look so good, we are so good. Because you're good looking people. Yes? Yes. Look at your neighbor to the right and the left and tell them that you look good today. Go ahead, Jason. You look good. You look good. You look good. Why? Because the closet designed you. You're good looking. That's perfect. So accept yourself as you are. Yes? Yes. What? Jesus says, if you want to have real life, if you really want to have abundant life, if you really want to live like me, and do these things, then you got to do a couple things. Because what happens is, our young man is waiting for his respectful answer. But Jesus says, you need to have a change of heart to have the desires of your heart. And that sounds backwards, doesn't it? Because if I have a change of heart, then I'll get the desires of my heart. So the guy's saying, what do I need to do? Jesus says, no, I don't want you to do anything. I want you to be. Being is a change of heart that says, I am no longer the owner of everything I have. I am the steward of everything I have. That's a change of heart, which is a change of thinking. And that's what Jesus is saying, taking him. If you want to have to live the life you want to, you need to have a change of heart, which leads to change of thinking. Because remember, our guy is rich, yes? Yes. yes. God does not care if you're rich. God has made some people wealthy, and it's a good thing. Amen? Amen. Amen? And as long as their heart is right, the Father says, it's okay. Do your yes. thing. Live for me. Yes. But now Jesus is getting deeper into this guy's head, into his heart. He gives him this one. You ready? Sell your possessions. <gasps> <laughs> At the end of the passage, 
It says, and he walked away sad because he had many possessions. Another passage says, he was rich. It's okay to have stuff. Amen? Amen. Man, I got a lot of stuff. <laughs> I am rich, but I got a lot of stuff. <laughs> but the Father says, make sure your heart is right. Because remember, the Father has gifted him to become successful. The Father is not, Jesus is not saying to him, go be poor. Jesus is saying to him, have a change of attitude of heart. Many have taken this verse and created charities, which is a good thing, have created monasteries, which is a good thing, but their idea is, well, Jesus says, so I need to take a, pow a vow of poverty. That's not quite what Jesus is going with this. But people who decide to do that, that is good, because they do good work. But the Father is saying, no, I want you to go further. Here's an illustration from Mary J. Blige. Oh, about Mary <laughs> This is from, uh, a, uh, from a book called Dear Superstar by Derek Chin. Uh, he asked her the question, he says, he's trying to reconcile, he says, listen Mary, you're, you're a devout Christian. How do you reconcile blame with God? She replies, replies, my God is a God who wants me to have faith. He wants me to have blame. He wants me to, have the hot, to be the hottest thing on the block. I don't know what kind of God the rest of you are serving, but the God I serve says, Mary, you be the hottest thing this year. I'm going to make sure you're doing that. My God's the bomb, she says, as long as I am trusting and serving him with my heart and giving what he wants me to give. Now, we try to reconcile. How do you do this with this? And she says, it's a matter of the heart. So the folk did a survey a few years ago. <laughs> and so they do the survey. And they're asking people what kind of God they serve. They're going door to door, knocking on the door, and they knock, knock, knock. Yes, what do you want? Man? None of us like to do surveys. Amen? Amen. Come on, amen? Come on. Amen. Now you will remember, before we had the internet, right? And, no, no you guys are too young for that one. Never mind. When I was a kid, we didn't have internet. Okay? And so if people wanted to do a survey, they had to come knock on your door. And typically somebody was home. Typically they came between uh, 4 and 6, not 8 o'clock at night, like some knucklehead did the other night. Anyway, that's another story. So they said, listen, we're going to describe God to you. You tell us if this is the God you serve. And so they knock on this one guy's door. He says, you know, we want to know about the God you serve. Here's the God we were describing to you. He's all powerful. He's able to do miracles. He's able to call things to life. He's able to raise the dead. He's able to supply your need. Do you believe in that kind of God? The guy says, thinks for a moment, he goes, no, around here, we just believe in the ordinary God. <laughs> the God who just does normal stuff. <laughs> no. The Father is saying, I have gifted you with all of these things so that you may understand and know who I am. I am the God of miracles. I am the God that raises the dead. I am the God who reconciles relationships. Have your heart right that you may receive the life that you desire. Here's the next one. Treasure in heaven. Now we've had that one before, yes? What's the deal with treasure in heaven? Everybody wants treasure in heaven. We all want treasure in heaven, yes? yes. yes. Why? Because treasure in heaven does not just mean treasure there. It means treasure here. Because we're the king's kids, yes? yes? And since we're the king's kids, he will take care of us. Remember Matthew, you know, Luke, consider the lilies of the field. They neither flow nor they spin. Yet Solomon, in all of his glory, was not clothed like one of these. What's he saying to us? He's saying to have treasure in heaven begin to live the life that I called you to live. Understand and deal with the 100% I've given you. Use the 10% and let the kingdom grow. Because you will be blessed now. You will be blessed later. Manage that 100%. Give the 10% because you're honoring the Father. Why? Because we're developing treasures in heaven. Those of you who received money a few weeks ago, you went out and blessed people with it. Yes? Yes. Yes. Treasure in heaven. you got to bless someone. That's what the Father is saying. I want you to bless people. I want people to see and know me because you showed up. Amen? Amen. So repeat after me. I, I will, will, will show up. Show up. I, I will, will show, up. show up. Why? Because we 
we will have treasure now and treasure in heaven. And I don't want to tell you all the stories and stuff because you know the story. You have been blessed by God, by people who just kind of smile back at you, who just kind of say thank you because you have loved them for a moment. You've brought some life into their lives. That's treasure in heaven. When we get to heaven, yay! Right now, we keep doing what we're doing because we're storing up treasure in heaven. Here's the next one Jesus tells us because Jesus puts these three together. He says, first of all, if you want to have life, okay, have a heart change. Then he says, sell your possessions. Get your heart right. Let go of your stuff. And let me control your stuff because you're a steward. Then create treasure in heaven. Manage the 100%. Give the 10% that you may bless people. Then he lays this one last. Then follow me. What you saying, Jesus? Jesus is saying a change of heart, a change of attitude, then lets you begin to follow me and walk with me in ways that you never imagined. Because remember, the guy wants eternal life. He wants real life now and later. And Jesus says to get not real life now and later. Do these things. Attitude. Oh. Treasure in heaven. Follow me. Because he changes his heart. Micah posts us here. Here is Micah 6 8. We sing this song <clears throat> often. But here's what God is saying to this young man. He's saying, He's shown you, old man, what is, what is good? There it is. What is good? I can get back. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly? Remember the commandments? Love your neighbor as yourself. Honor your mother and father. Don't steal. Don't kill. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Justice. Take care of your neighbor. This is a Jewish guy. He knows he's supposed to be doing that. He's not doing it. Love kindness and mercy. Let mercy be about you. Let kindness be about you. As Paul would say, let your forbearing spirit be made known to everyone. Then humble yourself and walk humbly with your God. That's what Jesus is driving this guy to. That he walks humbly with his God. Why? Because there's a change of heart. There's a change of attitude. Because suddenly, Jesus is saying to him, I want all of you, as we sang before, with heart abandoned, my soul, everything I am belongs to you. But here's his reaction. He's sad. He's upset because that's not what he came for. Amen? Amen? He walks away because he had great wealth and possessions. He forgets the principle. The principle is, did he have great wealth or did the great wealth have him? The great wealth had him because he was clinging to his possessions. His possessions as opposed to clinging to the God who has created him. And we all get into that trap. This is mine. And the father says, no, it's not. Remember the guy with the barns? Oh, man, my crops are so good. I'll build, I will build bigger barns. And I'll eat, drink, and be merry. So take care of yourself. The father says, this night, your soul is required of you, you fool. Why? Because the father is saying the emphasis needs to be on the fact that you're a manager, not so why do we get this way? There's a couple of reasons. Here they are. First one is lack of stewardship. Lack of stewardship is 100%. We forget that we have 90% and 10%. That's 100. So we deal with it all. The Father wants to deal with it all because we belong to Him. Yes? Yes. 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 And since we belong to Him, it all belongs to Him. All He's saying is, let me take the not, let me take the 10%, and then we will stretch the rest to make it work. Why? Because we need to be managers of that. So what do you do? Well, first of all, we need to understand that if we have a problem managing 100%, we need to get help. Amen? Amen. amen. Come on, say amen. 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 Because see, what happens is we pretend we don't need help when we do. And so we get in a jam. So there's a couple of things that are out there for us. These are all Christian things for us to deal with. The first one is this one. We used to do a Dave Ramsey seminar. And, you know, it was great. But, you know, being who we are, sometimes we say, hey, I don't need that because I want people to feel like I don't know how to manage my life. That's not the issue. 
The issue is how do I make sure that I'm honoring God's kingdom with my 100%? Because God says 90 and 10. Let's give me the 10. So the first thing is this one. Dave Ramsey, a good seminar. You want to do Dave Ramsey? Get help from somewhere. The next one is this one. You know, we are members of this church. Yes? yes. If you yes. walk through the doors of this church on a regular basis, call this church your home, then you get to sign up for the Christian Community Credit Union. Now, this isn't an advertisement for the credit union, but it is, because we use the credit union. I use the credit union. You know, what happens in here is there are things in here that will help you manage money. Now, we all want a good deal, yes? Yes. yes. I mean, we want the best deal we can get anywhere, yes? Yes. You go across town and down to San Jose to get the best deal, yes? Yes. yes. <laughs> what <not? laughs> These are resources that the Father gives us that we can do. Look at the sermon next to The sermon next to talks about uh, the Ten Commandments of giving. Ten Commandments of money management. You know, I, I stole some of those from uh, John Lord Burton, change the past. But that's what the scriptures tell us and instruct us to do. Why? Because the Father wants us to manage the 100%. He just wants the 10. He will take the 90 and deal with it. The next one is a lack of trust. A lack of trust speaks to our need. Ready for this? It speaks to our, it speaks to our need for control and security. Do we really trust God? Do I believe that God will provide for me? Do I really believe that if I honor him with my 10%, my life will be satisfying and full. Do I really believe those questions? In my life, yes, I do. Carol's life, yes, she did. In our children's life, hopefully we have taught them that same thing. Yes, they do. Why? Because real meaning comes to abundance. We've heard the testimonies of our own people about what it means to give. What it means when God takes, when we give the Father our 10% and he takes the 90% and makes it work. What the devil wants to do is he wants to come in and say, well, you really need that because you've got to do this and this and this and this. Well, suddenly, if you've got to do this, this, and this, and this, how about spending some time in prayer with you? I remember once we, uh, Tanisha was like, we were trying to figure out how to pay this huge medical bill. You know, we were in school, yet we had no money. We were praying, Lord, how do we do this? How do we do this? And so we had to, we had to do the surgery. And this woman walks up to me from this, uh, this agency. She says, Mr. Man, uh, I belong to this agency, and we, we know your case, and Tanisha, blah, blah, blah. We're going to take care of the bill. My arrogant self says, well, no, you know, um, I think we'll be able to handle it. We'll figure it out somehow. And then God said to me, shut up and listen to the lady, will you? And I did. Because my pride, my wanting control, said I can do this. When I knew I couldn't. But the father saying, I'm trying to bless you, stupid. Shut up. <laughs> Let the lady talk. And she did. She blessed us. The next thing that the bill was gone. Why? Because the father was taking from a crippled children's society. You know, and it blessed our hearts. You know, but because we want control, we often miss God's blessing. Do I trust God? And when God sends it, am I going to say yes to it? Then the next one is this one. Greed. Greed. Greed speaks to the two-year-old in all of us because the first words out of a two- or three-year-old is mine. Yes? <laughs> yeah. I mean, because mine is always mine. You can't take them into the gross, into the, into the, into the Toys R Us you know, or, the, or, or Target. You know, it's mine, Walmart. No, it's mine. No, it's not yours. It's the store. I don't want to pay for that. It's mine. <laughs> but see, we get that. Because we become like Gollum in Lord of the Rings. I remember you will remember Lord of the Rings, that wonderful trilogy. It keeps teaching us a lot about ourselves. But Gollum had the ring first, the precious, and he had to have his ring. But he forgot in his greed and want for the ring that the ring was controlling him and that the ring was taking over him. Because what happens is in our lives, our greed takes over us. And so it takes us over so that we have hard hearts because we want to desire to keep it for ourselves. Money will solve my problems. It's mine. No, it's not. It's the Lord's. And the Father says, I want you to return this small parts portion to me. And then our hearts say, no, I deserve this. I need this because X, Y, and Z, and W. The Father says, let me bless you. Because greed.
greed speaks to the two-year-old within us. Lack of trust speaks to our need for control and security. Lack of, lack of stewardship means that we need help managing the whole 100%. The last one is this rebellion. Rebellion speaks to, our, speaks to our own arrogance, our own pride. What we do in our stewardship reveals the condition of our hearts. And that was the issue with this young man. That's why I call him a bewildered young man. So he's holy, he's, he's ambitious, you know, he wants to be righteous, but he doesn't want to take the next step and say, God, I really want to trust you. Instead, he wallows in his stuff, he walks away from it. Sad because his possessions manage him instead of him managing his possessions. God says, I want you to trust me. I want you to walk with me. Because rebellion is not just an issue of wallet. It is not just an issue of thinking. Rebellion is an issue of the heart. Because if I'm not going to follow the Father in one thing, I'm not going to follow the Father in a lot of I keep making excuses. Jesus says so well, he says, a little leaven leavens the whole loaf. What's he saying to us there? He's saying that, you know, you take a little yeast, you put it in the, in the bread, and a little yeast spreads out through the whole loaf of bread. It doesn't stay in one spot. Well, that's what happens with rebellion in our life. It just begins to blossom. Then we have a rebellious heart, a rebellious attitude. That's what happened with that young man. The father says, no, I want you to give me your heart. And I will take care of the rest. I want you to trust me. I want you to let me help you deal with whatever issues you have. Because I am the one who's designed you. Now, yes, this is our Pledge Sunday. We bring forward our pledges and coming to the table in a moment. And as you come, I want you to take a minute and pray. Fill out your blue card and bring it to play. If you don't have it, you know, there's one in your bulletin. You know, if you left it at home, remember what it said. Now, be careful. Because here's what happened to me when I'm filling out my blue card. You see, here's my blue card right here. It's all filled out. Can you see that, Brenda? Put some writing on that. Okay, it's filled out. Okay, Cheryl, see that? Oh, on this side, you see the ink? It's filled out, okay? <laughs> here's what happened. I'm filling out my card, you know, and I put down my thing. And then the Lord said to me, are you serious? I said, well, yeah. He said, seriously? I said, okay. What are you saying? He said, well, can you trust me? I said, yeah. Then trust me. So I did up my pledge. Gladly. But you know, the father didn't say, hey, come on, you can do better than that. Because I so I am. So I scratched it out and put it in a new number. Why? Because what happens here is I am trusting the Father with everything I have. Why? Because that's what he asked me to do. Because I don't want to be rebellious, I don't want to be greedy. Because it's easy to be greedy. I don't want to not trust the Father. I don't want to just go around his commandments. I want to love the will of my God with all my heart and my mind. So I'm asking you to do the same thing. Trust the Father. So as we come to the table this morning, we'll come down this aisle, we'll up this aisle. But as we come to the table this morning, everyone's welcome. If you have a blue card, fine. You're visiting with us, don't worry about it. Okay? If you remember, call yourself a member of the church. Come on. Just take a moment. You haven't prayed yet? Say I'm the one who can't say Lord, what would you have me to do? Let's pray. Bless us. We thank you for who you are and who you are. Lord, we're committing ourselves to you, Lord. We bring these to you because, Lord, you tell us to bring. I see you still out, so Father, we're bringing these to you this morning. Lord, with eyes and hearts of faith, the Lord, whatever we write down, Lord, large or small, the Father, you are going to provide it, and the Father, you will enlarge the borders of our church, Lord, beyond our wildest imaginings, because, Father, we want you to do what you said. And Lord, if we would trust you, you will open the windows of heaven and pour out upon us blessings that we do not have room to receive. And so, Father, we commit these offerings to you, these pledge cards to you. Lord, with the expectation that, Father, you are going to provide everything we need. Because we
Lord, we trust you to be our provider. Now, Jesus, as we come to your table, Lord, we ask that you guide us with your grace and your spirit. So, Lord, we would, as we take the bread, Lord, as we take the wine, and Lord, you would remind us again of how much you have loved us, how much you have blessed us by dying on the cross for us. These things, Lord Jesus, we pray in your holy, your mighty, and your blessing. Amen.